previously, I promised to talk about what the James Webb Telescope may tell us about newborn planets and the subsequent formation of planetary systems. I said, and I quote, It includes the formation of the solar system and the recent history of the Earth. It's a cosmology that involves us. End quote. Those who have watched the feature-length videos on the Thunderbolts website, Symbols of an Alien Sky and the lightning-scarred planet Mars, may appreciate the extent of the revolution in all the sciences and humanities that are implied by the electric universe paradigm. Fred Hoyle in 1950 expressed it well, open quote, If there is one important result that comes out of our inquiry into the nature of the universe, it is this. When by patient inquiry we learn the answer to any problem, we always find, both as a whole and in detail, that the answer thus revealed is finer in concept and design than anything we could ever have arrived at by a random guess. End quote. Thankfully, the $10 billion James Webb Space Telescope has been successfully launched towards its parking spot 1.6 million kilometres away. That's about four times the distance to the Moon. We are told it will take a month to get there and another five months before its infrared eyes are ready to start scanning the cosmos in a high-stakes quest to behold light from the first stars and galaxies and to scour the universe for hints of life. The technology is amazing, but the real science that is needed to properly understand the observations is non-existent. Our sapphire plasma experiment proved that astrophysicists don't understand stars and their source of radiant energy. The notion of first light is based solely on the Big Bang creation myth, which I dealt with in part one of this series. As for gravitational cosmology, Newton's view of gravity has only been shown to work in the solar system, and Einstein's warped view of gravity in his non-physical theory of space and time did away with Newton's force of gravity, the force we experience every waking moment. Einstein stopped doing science by elasticizing the fundamental standards of length and time. At the same time, Quantum theory divorced physical cause from effect, which is fundamental to science. So it is no surprise that recent articles declare an emergency in Big Bang cosmology and offer no obvious way out of the dead end. Meanwhile, all other creation myths from around the world have been shown by scholars to have a common origin in a celestial cosmology that is ignored while featuring identifiable planets battling with strange-looking thunderbolts in a doomsday sky. Their creation stories tell of the establishment of the present sky following a period of apocalyptic chaos. Rationally, those stories can have nothing to do with the creation of the universe. On December 1st, New Scientist published an article titled Is Our Solar System a Cosmic Oddity? Evidence from exoplanets says yes. The author goes on to suggest that the story of the formation of the solar system has started to look like a fairy tale. It is, in fact, a bedtime story invented to make us feel safe because the echoes of those creation events have imprinted an instinctive existential fear in humans which we see manipulated by many unprincipled leaders throughout history. The solar system has a frightful recent history that is essential to grasp before we have any hope of understanding exoplanetary systems, ourselves, or life in the universe. The hopes and massive investment in the James Webb Space Telescope will not benefit us all without real science to understand the observations. So an introduction is essential because the events I'm about to describe and explain in the upcoming New Year episode is so different to anything you have heard before. The panorama is both breathtaking and disturbing. It changes everything. In part two of this series on the discoveries available to the James Webb Space Telescope, I explained the simultaneous electric birth of stars and gas giant planets in molecular clouds. This has now been essentially confirmed by a report this week in phys.org 
whereby up to 170 free-floating Jupiter-sized planets have been found 420 light-years away in a star cluster in the Milky Way. This number greatly exceeded expectations. They were only found because they were hot enough to glow in infrared light. It's assumed they were born recently and it is only their natal heat that allows us to see them. But in an electric galaxy, all free-floating bodies will intercept some electrical energy sufficient to heat them, so they are not steadily cooling and their age is indeterminate. But this discovery raises serious problems for the standard hypothesis that such bodies formed by gravitational accretion about a bright star and subsequent ejection by planet-to-planet scatterings. In the electric universe of electric stars, these free-floating Jupiter-sized planets are formed singly or in pairs at the low end of the brown dwarf star masses. In my previous Space News I wrote, and I quote, These stars are arguably the most important target for the infrared James Webb telescope because they are the most numerous and some of the closest stars to us. The telescope should confirm that all brown dwarfs are gas giant-sized bodies enclosed in a huge red anode glow. To give some idea, if Jupiter's present invisible plasma sheath were lit up, it would appear in the sky at opposition the size of the Sun. Brown dwarfs are simply small red giants. In December 1999, I published Other Stars, Other Worlds, Other Life on my Holo Science website. There I wrote, open quote, In the last few years, a new class of faint stars has been discovered. They are called L-type brown dwarfs because the element lithium appears in their spectra. They are the most numerous stellar objects in the galaxy and bridge the gap between stars and Jupiter-sized planets. They are too small to be shining from internal thermonuclear power. A further puzzle is that they radiate blue and ultraviolet light, even though they are cool at a temperature of around 950 Kelvin. Water molecules dominate their spectrum. All of these puzzles are simply explained by an electric star. And I note here, in 2019 it was shown that lithium is produced by low-energy nuclear transmutation in the sapphire plasma reactor. I continue... There is no lower limit to the size of a body that can accept electric power from the galaxy, so the temperatures of smaller dwarfs will range down to levels conducive to life. The light of a red star is due to the distended anode glow of an electrically low-stressed star. The blue and ultraviolet light come from a low-energy corona. Since an electric star is heated externally, a planet need not be destroyed by orbiting within its anode glow. In fact, life is not only possible inside the glow of a small brown dwarf, it seems far more likely than a planet orbiting outside a star. This is because the radiant energy arriving on a planet orbiting inside a glowing sphere is evenly distributed over the entire surface of the planet. There are no seasons, no tropics and no ice caps. A planet does not have to rotate, its axis can point in any direction and its orbit can be eccentric. The radiant energy received by the planet will be strongest at the red and blue ends of the spectrum. Photosynthesis relies on red light. Sky light would be a pale purple, the classical purple dawn of creation. L-type brown dwarfs have water as a dominant molecule in their spectra, along with many other biologically important molecules and elements. Its children would accumulate atmospheres and water would mist down. It is therefore of particular interest that most of the extrasolar planets discovered are gas giants, several times the size of Jupiter, orbiting their star extremely closely. It is our system of distantly orbiting planets that seems the odd one out. In fact, it argues in favour of a galactic traffic accident between the Sun and a sub-brown dwarf like Jupiter or Saturn. End quote. Since I wrote that article, there have been many developments. For example, the Kepler and TESS space telescopes have discovered that hot Jupiters are less common than previously thought, and that so-called super-Earths are the most numerous class of exoplanet. 
the most important developments in electric universe thinking is a more mature understanding of electrogravity, supported by the general electrodynamic theory of the great experimental scientist of the 19th century, Wilhelm Weber, together with the observations of the modern-day Galileo, Dr. Halton Arp. Unlike the Big Bang unbalanced universe, the electric universe is in balance with a dipole of gravitational force which is identical to the magnetic force but manifests weakly due to the gravitational distortion of the electrical structure within the electron and proton inside the atoms of a celestial body. The gravity of that body is established initially by the powerful long-range electromagnetic convection of matter into the centre of the Birkelin current filament in a molecular cloud. Being a dipole electric force, the gravity of a star or planet will change with changes to the surface charge of that body. This provides the essential feedback mechanism required for the ready capture of passing bodies and the rapid stabilisation of orbits. Halton Arp provided a fundamental benchmark for real cosmology when he found that the universe is not expanding. It is balanced and requires a repulsive gravity to explain his extensive observations. The electric universe had to meet that observational benchmark and it does so for the simple reason that all celestial bodies will be spherically polarised with the same gravitational pole facing outwards. They will repel each other. Every ponderable body is subject to that repulsive force of gravity from all of the other matter in the universe, a manifestation of Mach's principle, which results in gravity appearing to be an attractive force. This attribute is essential to understand our survival of the planetary close encounters recorded by our prehistoric mythmakers and memorialized by cultures around the world. It explains why the first civilizations arose suddenly in a thunderclap following those events. The unexpectedly large number of free-floating Jupiter-sized planets in a single nearby star cluster announced in the phys.org report has particular significance for our electric universe cosmology. In the electric universe, these objects are not free-floating planets, but are in fact brown dwarf stars that glow in infrared because they are receiving a low level of electric power from the galactic circuit, sufficient to establish a discharge manifesting as a red anode sheath. Such objects form a reservoir of brown dwarf stellar systems that could encounter and become integrated into a more powerful star system, like that of our Sun. That there are so many of them goes to explain why such an event is not only plausible, but inevitable. <laughs>